Bienvenidos al Coloquio Nacional en Inteligencia Artificial. Uh, welcome to the AI Colloquium. It's a pleasure and an honor for, for me to introduce Professor Andrew Davidson. Uh, he's Professor of Robotic Vision and Director of the Dyson Robotics Laboratory at Imperial College. His long-term research focuses on simultaneous localization and mapping and its evolution towards general special AI, computer vision algorithms who enable robots and other artificial devices to map, localize within, and ultimately understand and interact with 3D spaces. With his research group and collaborators, he has consistently developed and demonstrated breakthrough systems, including the, the first mono-slam system, Kinect Fusion, SLAM++, and Code Slam. And recent prizes he has obtained include base paper at ECCB 2016 and base paper honorable mention and CVPR 2018. He has also strong involvement in taking this technology into the real applications, in particular through his work with Dyson on the design of the visual mapping system inside the Dyson 360 iRobot vacuum cleaner. And uh, he's also co-founder of the Applied Slam Startup Slam Core. Uh, he was elected fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2017. And uh, he's going to talk today, uh, the title of his talk is From Slam to Spatial AI. So welcome, Andrew, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yes, th thank you to, to everyone who's uh, organized this talk for uh, inviting me, and it's a pleasure to, to talk to researchers in, in Mexico. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Good. Can I just check that that's coming through okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So thanks again. So um, yes. So as uh, Enrique kindly said in the introduction, that the title of my talk is from SLAM to Spatial AI, and I will explain what I mean by that. And, and in this talk, I'll show you some of the research that we've been doing over, over the last years uh, that, that I've been working in this area uh, and also give you some of my general kind of thoughts about progress in this area, uh, some, some very recent research and maybe some thoughts about where things are going in the future. So we're at a kind of interesting point, I, I think, in this technology around visual slam. So visual slam is, is really the area that I've focused on through most of my career and it's all about how do we enable a robot to understand the space around it and to estimate its position within that space uh, and in particular I've been interested in doing that with vision so using pr cameras as the main type of sensor and I've been in this area as a researcher for well, really, really since my PhD about 25 years ago when I, when I started working on that uh, but now some of the technology that we started working on then has found its way into real products. And that's very exciting. I've just shown a few examples here. And actually, they're in several different categories. So we have uh, robot vacuum cleaners. So this is actually the Dyson 360i, which was a project I was personally uh, involved in uh, working with Dyson to design the SLAM system that's in this robot. Uh, there are mobile phones that, that now do visual slam. So this is an, an example of a smartphone uh, that, that can estimate its position within, within a room and build a map of that room. There are visual slam systems within headsets for virtual and augmented reality. This is a demo from Microsoft uh, HoloLens. And there's also visual slam inside various drones from companies like DJI and Skydio. So these sy systems, these are, you know, these are products you can buy they actually have the capability to use cameras to map the space around them. Um, and that's actually working you know, well enough to be used in products. 
Um, but I think it would be fair to say that all of these are fairly kind of early products in, in terms of the smart robotic products we might imagine in the longer term. So in terms of what they actually do with their visual slam systems, they do build a map of the space around them, but it's a fairly sparse and simple map of, of landmarks and points, for instance. They have some level of, of dense mapping and scene understanding, uh, but, but they're, you know, fairly, uh, uh, you know, early products, I would say, in, in, in this area. Um, so how, how, how can we understand the progress in, in SLAM? So, you know, it's taken quite a number of years just to get to that position where there are any products at all with, with Visual SLAM. But one way I like to think about progress in SLAM is through lab, uh, levels of capability. Uh, so this is a slide actually from our startup uh, SLAM core where we think about levels of performance in SLAM, where level one is robust localization, essentially building a good enough map to know where you are in a space. Level two is dense mapping, which means actually trying to build a dense understanding of the scene around you, the shape of the geometry that, that's around you. And then level three, which is very much a current research interest, is semantic understanding. So can you actually add meaning to the geometry uh, that, that's around you? So a term I've been using recently is, is spatial AI. To, to really, it's, for me, it's not something different from SLAM. It's, it's something that SLAM has always been aiming towards and is gradually evolving into. So in my mind, this real-time vision mapping capability becomes useful when it actually enables a, a device such as a robot to be intelligent in the space that it's in. So SLAM is not just about positioning X, Y, Z, Ultimately, it should be about actually enabling a device to it to behave intelligently. And, and I think using this term spatial AI makes that more clear that that's what we're aiming towards. So where might we, might we get to in spatial AI in the longer term future? So I, there's a couple of ideas here. One would be a much more general purpose robot for the home. And, and this is just a kind of fake image that I found on the Internet somewhere. It's not representative of any company's real idea for a product in this area. But imagine that you could buy a robot like this that would be a mass market, general purpose household robot for cleaning and tidying of complicated rooms and objects. Um, so that would need to be have a very, very capable spatial AI system. It would need to understand 3D scenes. It would need to understand objects. It would probably also need to understand people. But also, if you wanted to actually sell this as a product, its spatial AI system would have to fit within certain constraints of price, aesthetics, size, safety, power usage. So all of those things would have to be done within, you know, constraints that actually might look like a consumer product. Um, here's another example product, which I think that if it existed would really change the world. So a really general purpose augmented reality system. So something that's not a heavy headset, but something that really has the size and weight of a normal pair of glasses. Uh, and it would have the ability to um, provide a robust and accurate real-time overlay and spatial memory of, of all the places and objects and people that you encountered in your life. So it would really be able to augment your intelligence in a very general way. So if that product existed, I think that could be the next you know, major computing platform that might maybe eventually replace the smartphones in our pockets. So products like that, uh, either of those two that I've shown you, I, th I think would be very impactful, but they don't exist yet. I don't think it's because there's no demand. I think it's because no one knows how to make them. It's, it's too difficult. Uh, so exactly the kind of research I'm interested in is how might we get across this big gap from the current products that we already have we have some idea of you know, current research that's going on in my lab, in other labs, current prototypes, but I still think there's a big, big gap to this full spatial AI performance that might enable really general, powerful products like that. So especially when you consider the constraints of things like small size and low power. So it's no good to carry you know, a room full of GPUs <laughs> around with you, you know, inside a small device, uh, for instance. Um, so some of my thinking about this, uh, this area of spatial AI in, in general, I've recently been writing about in a, in a series of papers. These are very sort of personal 
discussion uh, kind of white papers uh, in, in the future mapping series. If you're interested, you can find the first one and the second one on, on archive. If you go to my website, you'll easily find them. So really thinking about the properties of spatial AI. And there's, there's a few hypotheses in there. In the first paper especially, there's, there's, a, there's some hypotheses uh, that, that say that we think the properties of a spatial AI system are probably quite general. Um, so that means even though there are many different possible applications, you know, whether that's an AR system in, in glasses, whether it's a, a vacuum cleaning robot, whether it's a drone, whether it's something else, they will clearly have quite different needs, different performance, different constraints. But I think there's something common about how their spatial AI systems should work. And, and that's the sort of research that I'm interested in, uh, in doing. Um, so just another kind of recent piece of work that I'd like to mention, a project that I was involved in uh, last year with, with, with this set of uh, collaborators from, from a lot of uh, different uh, universities and, and companies was also thinking ambitiously about a kind of longer term goals, especially in robotics, and trying to specify a set of tasks that you might want robots to solve, which I would, which we gave the, the, the general name rearrangement. So if you've got something like an untidy room that you want to turn into a tidy room, or maybe you've got a set of parts that you want to assemble into some kind of object. I, that we, we think there's a wide range of tasks that, be, that can be considered as some type of rearrangement. And, and the goal about thinking about things like this is to try and make some specifications of how you might judge the performance of an agent that's trying to solve a task like that. So whether it's in the simulation or whether it's actually a robot operating in, in, in the real world. Because I think, in, in my opinion, a lot of the work that's done in, in AI at the moment and lots of the papers you read and challenges, they're not really ambitious enough. They're not really aiming for this very general sort of uh, uh, spatial understanding that, that would enable a robot to do anything like the kind of things a, a human can do. So that's another in interesting paper to, uh, to have a look at if you'd like to. Um, and, and the final thing to mention in this kind of in introduction is uh, you know, a particular project of ours from the Dyson Robotics Lab, which, which is actually mentioned in the rearrangement paper, is, is a project called RL Bench. So this is, I'll just show you a quick video. This is our own robot simulation uh, env environment where we've implemented a very wide range of different robot tasks. So this is all based around a robot arm that's currently attached to a desk. Um, but there's, there's a whole load of challenge still ju just in this setting. But, but this is trying to give some sort of, again, ambition for the sort of tasks that we might want robots to be able to do uh, in, in the future. So that's an open source uh, project if people are interested in using that. OK, so I'm, I'm going to come on to talking about some of our recent research in this area. But I'd just like to talk about a little bit of the history uh, of, of the work in particular that I've done in, in SLAM and, and spatial AI. And in particular, this refers back to the picture I showed you earlier of, of layers of capability in, in SLAM. So for the first years of my uh, career, from my PhD and onwards, I was particularly focused on, on localization. So in particular, how could we uh, estimate the position of a camera which is moving through a, a scene? Uh, and in 2003, for the first time, we published this algorithm called MonoSLAM. Uh, which was the first time we, we were able to show real-time uh, SLAM from, from a single camera. So I'll just show you this uh, briefly. So here's the, here's the setup. We've got as a single webcam, and it's just a cheap webcam. There's no other sensors involved, and it's connected to a computer. And, and we're moving this camera around inside a room in quite a general free 3D way here. And our goal is to estimate the position of this camera in real time and to do that by building some kind of visual map of the scene. So in this image, you, you can see now the video from the camera as it's moving around. And you see that what we're basically doing is detecting and tracking a set of landmarks in this scene. So each of these boxes is a landmark feature point that we have automatically detected in the scene, which is a high texture point, which we think we can reliably track 
through the future. So you'll see that each of these is ni nicely tracked and the colors indicate something about the quality of tracking. So especially the red points are the ones that are being you know, tracked re repeatedly. We feed all of those measurements. So every time we find one of those features in an image, it basically gives us a measurement of the relative position of that landmark and the camera. We feed all of those measurements into a probabilistic uh, localization engine. So here we were using an, an extended Kalman filter, which is a probabilistic estimator, which jointly estimates the motion of the camera and the position of the landmarks. So let me just pause this for a second. So this is essentially the output of our estimator. So this uh, thing here that's flying around is the estimated position of the camera that's updated 30 times per second, once for every new video frame. These things here are the estimated positions of the landmarks. So each landmark has a unique uh, you know, texture patch that identifies it. But we're also displaying here these ellipsoid regions. And this indicates the uncertainty in the position of these landmarks. So you'll see that the more observations we get of the landmarks from different positions of the camera, we're able to gradually reduce the uncertainty and, and get more and more uh, estimate, uh, but high quality estimates of where they are in, in the scene. Um, so that's really the first level of SLAM. We're, we're able to build a map that enables the camera to know where it is, um, but you'll see, you know, it's a very sparse map. So that map is not really yet giving us much information about what's in the scene around the camera. So the next level of capability is dense mapping. And we did various um, pieces of work on, on, on dense mapping going back to about 2010 with systems like DTAM and Connect Fusion. Uh, I'll show you this one. So this was from a few years uh, later, a system called Elastic Fusion. So this is what we, we call a dense uh, SLAM system. So we have a, a camera moving around through, through the scene. This is actually our, our lab room at Imperial College. Um, and we are still doing SLAM. We're jointly estimating the motion of the camera and building a map of the scene. But you now you'll see that the map of the scene is much more detailed than before. So rather than just a few points, we're now estimating the shape of the whole kind of surface of every object in the scene. So in fact, the representation of 3D that we're using here is, is a circle map. So if you look closely at this uh, reconstruction, you'll see it's made up, up of uh, or millions of little tiny uh, disks. Uh, but there are some nice properties of how this algorithm works. One is that it can do loop closure. So you'll see here that occasionally you'll see parts of the 3D reconstruction that don't line up, but we're actually able to detect those kind of misalignments and fix them and in SLAM, that's what we call loop closure. So we're able to kind of correct these small errors that have built up. And there in just a, you know, a two or three minutes of scanning, we've been able to build this model of a whole room. So I should say that the camera we were using here is a little bit different from just a color camera. It's a, it's a depth camera, a bit like a Kinect uh, sensor that also gives us depth information. But in fact, we are able to do this kind of thing also with, with standard color cameras. It's just... It, it's it's harder and takes more more computation and and is hard to get as accurate as this. Um, so that's dense slam, and then really the, the the final kind of layer of capability to talk about now is is semantic un understanding. So the previous map that you saw, it's very very detailed, but it's all still essentially just geometry, whereas a representation that's going to actually be useful for a robot to do intelligent things has to have something more. It has to have an understanding of what the actual objects are in that scene. Um, so here you'll see where we're trying to color objects in the scene according to what type of objects, so blue for chair, green for table, uh, et cetera. So the first system that we worked on uh, that tried to do semantic slam uh, in, in a very general way in my lab was, was called semantic fusion. And this was the sort of result that we were able to to get. And actually, this was quite a simple system in some ways, in that we were taking the exist the previous system I showed you, Elastic Fusion. So we, we have an input stream of RGB and depth images. We feed them to Elastic Fusion and can do a 3D reconstruction. But then we also take those images and we feed them to, to a CNN. So this is you know a, a convolutional neural network that has been trained to look at it, it images and label each pixel with a type of object that it thinks is present. So out, out of this CNN, we get a probability 
map for different classes. So this is the probability that every pixel of this image is part of the floor. This is the probability that, uh, that it's part of the sofa. Um, and then what we do is we literally just combine these two things. So we take the pro CNN probability maps from images and we project them into our 3D SLAM map. So then each little circle in our SLAM map is then holding uh, a, an estimate of what type of object it thinks it is. And then we can actually get much better labeling of a scene by this kind of incremental 3D fusion than you could get just from labeling a, a, a single image. So these are the sort of, uh, you know, labeled 3D reconstructions we were able to get. So, you know, if I look at this, I think, well, this is quite nice, but you can also see some of the, the problems here. So it's quite noisy looking. Sometimes there are mistakes. Um, and also there's no sense of, you know, individual objects here. This is really just, you know, gray means wall, green means bed, but there's no sense here of whether there's one bed or two beds or, or, or anything like that. It's really just sort of painting semantic texture on, on top of the scene. Okay, so, so that was some semantic fusion. Now I'm just gonna show you this uh, diagram and don't worry too much about the, the details of, of, of this. Um, but the point I want to make is that this is representing something like the structure of the, of the program that's implementing that semantic fusion system. And the main point that I want to make is this is quite complicated. And also it's quite kind of computationally costly. So a lot, there's a lot of data moving around between different modules here. So there's modules for tracking the camera, there's modules for labeling the images, there's modules for kind of fusing all of that uh, together. There's modules for, um, yeah, yeah, op optimizing the map after a loop closure, for, for instance. Um, and when we actually implement this on, on a computer at the moment, parts of this run on the CPU, parts of it run on the GPU. It's very, very kind of, kind of complicated. A lot of the data that's moving around this is also very large. So for, for instance, our map of the scene consists of 5 million circles. That's, that's a huge amount of data. So we have this system, it runs in real time, but it doesn't work that well. It, work, you know, it gives us something, but it's not the result we want. But, but also it has this very heavyweight and complicated computational requ requirements. So I look at this and I think, well, how are we gonna get to this very high performance, very low power, very compact spatial AI that we might need for you know, an embedded product? It seems like a very big gap. So I think a lot of our work is really trying to attack this question. And I, I think there are two kind of key um, lines of attack that we've particularly been interested in in our lab. One is to think about representation. So can we get away from these kind of enormous data representations like 5 million circles for a room to something that is much more compact? Because that meant then would be maybe more meaningful, but also much more efficient. The other kind of line that I'm very interested in recently is how does the structure of the computation that you need to do here relate actually to the structure of the computational hardware, the computer processors that you're actually going to work uh, work with? So I'll, I'll talk about the first of these first, which is um, representation. And I should you know, get, say something about SLAM and, and deep learning. So I've already shown you one example of how we're using deep learning within SLAM, the CNN that we were using to label uh, the, the scenes in, in semantic fusion. Uh, and, and probably if you're working in any type of AI at the moment, you'll, you'll be having these kind of thoughts every, every day about, you know, what's the right way to use deep learning in my application? I, I would say that in, in SLAM, you know, actually it's maybe one of the areas of, of, of AI where deep learning has not yet, you know, completely dominated um, what, how things work. A lot of really working SLAM systems are still mostly human designed. Uh, you know, you look inside any of those products I showed you earlier, there might be some neural networks, but actually most of the important stuff is not neural networks. Um, on the other hand, we are very open to, to deep learning and neural networks in, in SLAM. And in most of the research I'm doing now, we're using deep learning in, in various ways. Um, I think there's very much a kind of sliding scale between systems that you might fully human design and systems that you might just try and solve with a single neural network. And what most people building practical systems are doing at the moment is somewhere 
in the middle. So something quite modular, parts of it that you do know how to build and design, you build them like that, and you won't be able to beat that with deep learning. Parts that you don't quite know how to design, like for instance, semantic labeling is something that we just never knew how to do that without learning. Learning made it much better, but something like geometrical estimation and you know tracking a set of points and estimating the motion of a camera, there's still no better way to do that than the human designed algorithm. So we're building these kind of modular algorithms, but, but very much where learning can be useful, I think is in this question of representation that, that I mentioned. So when you've got something like a huge map of circles, what learning can do is try and find a kind of embedding, a much kind of smaller set of numbers that represent the interesting variation in that scene. So actually you probably don't need 5 million parameters to represent the things that are interesting to a robot about a room. You, you can learn something much better. So a lot of the work that we've been doing is along, along those lines. So a couple of uh, projects to, to mention from, from recent work are, are Code Slam and, and Scene Code. So, th so these were projects about essentially trying to do that. So trying, don't, don't, don't worry too much about the, the complicated picture here, but we're trying to find um, from a data set the, the, the relatively simple sort of variation in, in scenes. So, so if you have a, so we actually used a simulated data set here. So we've got a simulated uh, kind of computer graphics rendering of, of indoor scenes. And if you take a depth map from one of those indoor scenes, it will have a lot of variation. But if you look at millions of those depth maps, you can actually learn that the sort of variation that you see in, in natural scenes is much lower than all of the pixels in, in an image. So for instance, natural indoor scenes tend to consist of continuous solid objects and therefore the depth of nearby pixels is much more likely to be very similar. So, so the world is not the random point cloud, the world has a lot of structure and we're learning about that in, in these systems. And maybe if I just show you uh, this, this video here. So this is a scene code where we're, we're using this approach to, uh, to have this kind of coded learned representation, both of the depth structure of a scene and of the semantic content of, of a scene. So if we contrast this, this video with the semantic fusion video I showed you before, in, in, in a way they're trying to solve a similar task of taking multiple images and trying to fuse them into a 3D representation and estimate the semantic labels of, of that scene. But you'll see that the sort of performance is, is quite different. So in some ways this looks more kind of low resolution, it's kind of a bit blobby, but on the other hand, it's much more coherent. It doesn't have this kind of speckly noise. So we're not, sh you know, you can see sometimes we get things wrong and we're not sure whether this is for instance, a bed or a sofa, uh, but it's not like we're, we think this pixel is a bed and this pixel is a sofa and this one is a bed. Either we think the whole thing is a sofa or we think the whole thing is a bed. And when we get a bit more evidence, we're able to kind of flip the whole, the whole thing over. And that seems to be a much kind of smarter um, thing to do. Uh, so, so have a look at those projects if you're in, interested in. And, and in fact, um, that we, we have a project called Deep Factors, which, which is a, a kind of evolution and a fully probabilistic uh, implementation of, of, of these code type of methods, which is available as an open source uh, project. So have a look at that if, if you do, you're interested in that work, you can download that code. Um, so another project that I, I will show you, which is in the same sort of area of trying to use neural networks to represent the 3D shape of scenes, is actually a very new project that we've only recently put online, but it's one that we're quite excited about called uh, IMAP. So this is quite closely related to things like NERF, if you may have heard about that, which, which is um, a, a quite famous paper, which, which is using a general purpose multi-layer perceptron, so the most general type of neural network to represent the 3D shape of a, of a scene. So uh, th this is really a neural network where you feed in a coordinate and the network learns to output for every coordinate that you feed in what is the occupancy of, of that point in the scene? So it outputs you know, one if it thinks that's part of an obstacle and zero if it thinks that it's part of empty space. So what we have done in, in our new work called, uh, called IMAP 
is to implement a real-time SLAM system for the first time that uses this type of implicit neural network-based uh, representation. Um, so here, here's the, 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 the system being, being uh, demoed by, by PhD student Edgar Sukar. Um, so we, we move a depth camera around this scene in, in real time. And then here, what you can see is, is real time optimization of this implicit neural network, which is representing the scene. So as we capture every new color and depth image, we're using that as a sort of extra piece of training data to help us improve uh, this, this neural network. So you can see you know, the, 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 the actual data captured from the camera at the top here, and then just below that, these are the renderings from our neural network. So if the neural network's working really well, then these renderings should look the same as the actual captured data. And you can immediately see that this has some really nice properties, that, that this network. So it gives us a really sort of smooth and continuous representation of the scene. And, and one of the sort of really cool things it's able to do is, is to fill in areas even where it wasn't able to observe them. So there are some objects over here kind of on the on the right hand side of the room. We've never seen the back of these objects, but the neural network, it, you know, it has to generate an occupancy value everywhere. And it does a pretty nice job of kind of filling in plausible values uh, for, for the back of these objects, even if we've never seen them. Um, so, so this is very, very, very uh, new work. So, so another very nice property of this is that this is actually quite a small neural network. So it only has about one megabyte of, of weights, which means it's really a very kind of compact representation of the geometry uh, in, in, in this room. And that's one of the reasons we can actually run a system like this in real time. So we're actually training in real time to represent the shape of the scene. I'll just show you this part where we, we show that this is a genuine uh, uh, th 3D representation and it's very kind of you know, smooth and, and complete. Okay, so, so that system has, has this property of, of learning this kind of quite efficient representation of, of a scene using general purpose learning uh, mechanism. Um, so another kind of big focus of, of how do we use learning to, together, with, um, uh, together with SLAM is, is to focus much more on the objects in the scene. So, so yes, we can represent the whole shape of a scene, but actually, if a robot wants to do intelligent things in the scene, it doesn't necessarily need to understand everything. What it really, what's really important are the objects that it could possibly uh, interact with. So we've got a, a series of very promising work on, on really building SLAM maps that focus on the objects that they contain. So the first um, uh, piece of work we did in, in, in this direction, and it was a bit of a kind of landmark project for us, was called SLAM. Uh, plus plus. So this was now a, a few years ago. Um, if I just quickly show you, show you this video. So this was a system where, you know, similar to Elastic Fusion, it's a real time depth camera system. So we're moving a depth camera around in this scene. But different from Elastic Fusion, we're assuming here that we have prior knowledge of some of the objects that are going to be present in this scene. So here we've got, for instance, some chairs and, and tables. And actually, these are quite specific chairs and tables. So we know that this exact type of chair and this exact type of table are present in this scene. So then as the system progresses, we don't just do bottom-up mapping of the scene. We're, we're immediately doing object detection and we're trying to detect from the input depth images of this camera whether there are any instances of these known objects present. So you can hear, see in the scene there's many, many chairs here and then you'll see them appear in, in, the, in the SLAM map. So that the map only exists at the level of objects. There's no sort of incremental reconstruction. You'll see when we detect a chair, the whole chair is kind of popped into the map. And then the chairs take part in this factor graph. So they kind of become landmarks in our SLAM system, a bit like the original points in MonoSLAM. But now each one of those landmarks is a whole object. So that was, that was very promising, but the obvious limitation of this system was that 
you know, this worked for these very precise objects. So it only worked for, you know, this type of chair and this type of table. Um, so, so one of the things we've really been in, interested in generally is, um, first of all, how far can you go with that with assuming that you do have specific knowledge of objects? And uh, But on the other hand, how can you relax that uh, assumption? Uh, excuse my telephone in the, in the background. Um, so, so first of all, if you do have not knowledge of, of, of the shape of objects in the scene, what, what can you do with that? And actually, that's not a bad assumption in many uh, robotic situations, I, I think. Because imagine, imagine the robot of the future. It's probably connected to the internet. It probably has access to huge databases. There's actually no reason why it might not have you know, an awful lot of you know, knowledge about objects that, that it would typically find in a household, for instance. So in this system, we assume that we're, our robot has precise knowledge of the shape of the objects it's going to encounter in the form of CAD models of, of, of these objects. Um, it's going to fit them and try and estimate the position of these objects, but in a more difficult situation than we had in SLAM++, because these objects are actually, uh, you know, they're in clutter, they're on top of each other, they're occluding each other. Um, so here, here we show that we can build a system so here now it is a it is a slam system, but we have a camera that's mounted on this robot arm. So the the robot arm moves and observe, and observes the scene. Um, so you'll see that as as the camera is moving around, we get these different color and and depth views. We do some volumetric reconstruction, and when we've got enough confidence to estimate the position of one of these known three D objects we replace the volumetric reconstruction with actually the CAD model pose estimate for, the, for that object. So eventually this reconstruction will become you know, quite accurate in terms of estimated poses of all of these objects. And we know that you know, real objects can't intersect each other, real objects must lie on top of each other and that kind of thing. So those things help us to estimate the position even of the objects that we can't fully see because they're underneath other objects. Um, and then I'll just show you here some, something we can do with that, which is a robot, uh, a robot task. So, so here's, here's a situation where the robot comes across this cluttered pile of objects. Actually, the one it's interested in is this red box, and it would like to move it over to this brown area here. But it can't immediately do that, because when it reconstructs the scene, it figures out that there are some other objects on top of that. So once it's got enough confidence about that, it can start doing some grasping. So it's got a suction gripper here. And it first of all has to pick up these objects that are in the way. It moves those off to this to this bin over here. Um, and then once it's cleared those away, then finally it can grasp this red box and place it over here. And, and a thing to note is this is not just dropping it into the box because it's picked this up, up this known object in a known way, it can actually place it very carefully into a known uh, position in the box. Um, so that was with fully known uh, objects. So what can we do if we don't have full knowledge of the objects in the scene? In, in, what, in, the, in the weakest kind of situation, we might only be able to segment objects, but we don't really know anything about what they are. So in this system, we build a SLAM system, which builds a map of objects, but it individually builds a reconstruction for each one. So here we're using a, a neural network, mask RCNN, which can give us segmentations of objects in the scene, but we don't have any particular prior knowledge about the shape of these objects. So all that we do is, is for each new individual object, we have a separate 3D reconstruction. So the overall structure of this, of this map is, is a graph of objects, but each object is individually reconstructed. So that's nice because we can deal with pretty much any type of object and you'll see all these different objects that are being put into the map. But the disadvantage is that we can only really reconstruct the parts of the objects we can see. So some of these objects you'll see the reconstructions, they have holes in them and we haven't reconstructed the back of the objects that we've, we've, we've never seen. Um, so, so to tackle that, uh, some of our late, latest work is, is kind of somewhere in the middle. So what if we have partial uh, knowledge of, of the shape of objects? So in this system, we, we have kind of class 
based neural object uh, descriptors. So here we, we, we specifically look at four types of objects. So we've got um, bowls, cups, bottles, and, and cans. And for each of those types of objects, we don't have a specific CAD model, but we do have general knowledge of the type of shape of those objects. And that has come from about a large database of CAD objects. So for instance, we've got 3D models of 500 different types of mugs. From those mugs, we, we use a neural network. We actually use a, a 3D uh, variational autoencoder to learn a low dimensional embedding of the type of, of variation that you get in the shape of, of mugs. And then what we do at runtime, having detected that this is a mug, we then optimize uh, the, the code of, of, of that learned model to fit the observation that we're getting. So you'll see that when we add new objects into this 3D map here, we have this optimization phase where the objects appear, but then their shapes are gradually adjusted until they fit the shape of the observations that we're getting. <clears throat> and then again, we're basically building a map out of these objects. So, so our, we kind of use each one of these coded objects uh, as, as, as a landmark. And here's a kind of larger example where we're gonna take a camera all the way around this table and gradually add to and build this, this map of the 3D objects uh, uh, in the scene. Um, so let me just skip forward again here to an example of using this sort of system for, for robot manipulation. Um, so here's a robot looking at a scene where there are several uh, cups and, and bowls. It observes the scene from, from a couple of viewpoints and estimates the shapes and the positions of the objects in, in the scene. And then once it's got enough knowledge, it then goes into a grasping phase where first of all, it picks up the bowls and its goal is to place the goals into this box and, and actually stack them. So it picks them up in order of size. It picks up the biggest one first. It carefully places it in here. Then it picks up the next biggest one and drops it to stack inside and then picks up the next one and, and stacks it there. And then it, uh, okay, there's the last bowl. And then it picks up the cups and places those also neatly into the box. So you see a lot of work on robot grasping where people kind of stop at the grasp. So you grasp an object and then you just have to drop it. But we're very interested in you know, really precise grasping of objects such that you can precisely place them and do things like this, like tidying up, because um, that is much more useful, um, especially in the applications I'm interested in, mainly of, of indoor uh, robotics. Um, and I would argue strongly that doing this kind of precise manipulation and placing really strongly motivates having a full 3D understanding of, of the shape of things. Um, okay, so we, we, we're coming to the end. I'm just gonna talk ra rather quickly about the last uh, section here. So when I showed you this picture earlier, I, showed, I, I, I said that I thought there were two kind of key angles of attack to try and tackle this very complicated, expensive uh, sort of computation graph that we have in semantic fusion. And the second one of those is, is hardware. So, so a long-term interest of mine is thinking jointly about algorithms and the hardware that they will actually run on. And when I say hardware, I mainly mean processor hardware. I'm also somewhat interested in camera and sensor hardware, because I think we've been doing robotics and vision and AI for a long time using hardware that wasn't really designed for this. So we use cameras that were built for photography. We use computer processors that we used, that, you know, that were designed for graphics, for instance, like GPUs. Yes, they can do some things in AI pretty well, but I think they're, not, they're nothing like the end game of if we could really design hardware for AI, for robotics and vision, we'd probably end up in different places. And, and if you think about the algorithms you want to, to run, then you can think about what sort of hardware is best. And also maybe eventually you can influence the design of hardware so that people might build hardware that's much better for, for the things that we want to do. So just to firstly briefly mention in, in the sensor area, one thing we've been very interested in uh, uh, for a few years was event cameras. So you may have heard of 
of these. So, so whereas normal cameras capture whole frames of, of, of intensity, an event camera has a pixel by pixel asynchronous measurement of change of intensity. And out of an event camera, you get a much, uh, you get a low bit rate signal just about what has changed in an image. And that immediately appealed to me as fitting in with this idea of you know, being much more efficient. And, and we did a lot of work on trying to actually build SLAM systems that used uh, uh, event cameras. And this is one of the visualizations of that. Um, I don't have time to go into that much more. So what I'll talk about a little more is, is work around processors. So, um, you know, SLAM algorithms run, run on computer processors. Eventually, we would like them to run on tiny, very efficient processes. So uh, I was involved in one uh, research project in particular called the, called the Pamela Project, which was a joint project with several universities in the UK, really looking at the performance of different SLAM algorithms on different processing hardware from a huge GPU down to a tiny Im embedded board, trying to figure out what were the things that worked well, what were the things that didn't work well, and trying to open up some of these questions about what sort of hardware would, would, would be really good uh, for this, but also still uh, efficient. And there are really interesting things going on in, in computer architecture at the moment. And in particular, there's a new type of processor called, called a graph processor, which I find very uh, interesting. So in fact, there's, there's a company here in the UK called GraphCore, which designs a processor called an IPU, an intelligence processing unit, which they argue is much more suited to AI uh, workloads than, than a CPU or, or a GPU. So an IPU is, is a massively parallel processor. In that sense, it's a, it's a bit like a GPU. It has many, many processing cores on one chip, like a, a thousand or more. But the way that these cores are arranged and the sort of work they can do is very different from a GPU. So a GPU is, is good at workloads where every, every um, every uh, core is doing the same thing all of the time, whereas an IPU is much more general. Each of these cores can be doing different work at different times and then it has a very powerful interconnect structure. So you can have message passing going on between these cores with quite arbitrary patterns. So you call it a graph processor because this is good at implementing workloads that are well specified by a, a graph structure of different nodes that are connected together. And for me, that's exciting because a lot of the problems and algorithms I'm thinking about in, in SLAM and Spatial AI, they're all about graphs and how things uh, connect together. Um, so I've got very interested in thinking about how we can find the graphs in, in, in our SLAM algorithms and then map those down onto very efficient computing hardware. So this is one of GraphCore's visualizations. So they have a graph compiler that can take an algorithm or a neural network and compile it down, find its graph structure and map that onto hardware. That's just a really nice visualization they've come up with. Something that I've thought about a lot and, and is particular dis discussed in the future mapping uh, papers is finding the graphs in SLAM algorithms and how, how we would therefore then lay them out on really efficient computing hardware. And, and there's several really obvious graphs in SLAM, such as the the kind of connectivity of, of the different places in a map is usually well represented by, by a graph that looks something like this. Um, so this is very much on, ongoing work. Now, now we're very much on to thinking about you know, what could be the actual algorithms that could implement this type of you know, graph processing that could be really good and efficient for, for SLAM. And in the second uh, future mapping paper, we, we discuss that in, in more detail and in particular talk about Gaussian belief propagation as a general sort of algorithm which we think has the right properties for. It's something you can implement on a graph using message passing, but it's able to estimate you know, jointly consistent things across a whole distributed uh, uh, architecture. And actually, you know, this is not a new algorithm. This is a, an algorithm that's been known about for several decades, but it's an algorithm that was a bit sort of put to the side, maybe because it didn't work very well on, on the sort of computing hardware that's been around. But I think it's a strong candidate for the sort of algorithm that may come back strongly with, with this new type of graph uh, hardware. Um, so the most kind of concrete piece of work we've done so far 
is, is a paper we had at CVPR last year called Bundle Adjustment uh, on a Graph Processor, which uses Gaussian belief propagation to implement uh, you know, the well-known computer vision challenge of bundle adjustment, which is basically jointly estimating the positions of a set of cameras and a set of points, but using a very different sort of algorithm from what's normally uh, used on a CPU and showing just that we can run very, very fast using this distributed belief propagation algorithm on an IPU and, and really get breakthrough performance. So we think that's a great kind of marker for, for some of the directions we might go in uh, in, in, in the future. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to con conclude now. So, uh, yeah, so, so just some final thoughts. So spatial AI research is what I'm going to keep wor working on for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's very exciting. I think that some, some interesting research areas uh, for me are efficient 3D scene representations and systems for incremental scene understanding, co-design of processes, sensors, and algorithms, and integrated graph-based algorithms for estimation and machine learning. So just to mention uh, my, my affiliations, so I lead the Dyson Robotics Lab at Imperial College. So this is an academic lab, which is fu funded by and collaborating with uh, Dyson, a uh, company in the, in, in the UK with, that has uh, uh, great uh, am ambitions and ongoing re research in, in home robotics. Uh, and our lab you know, has, has openings for postdocs and uh, PhD students. We do long-term research on SLAM scene understanding and manipulation. And then my other affiliation is with SLAM Core, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is London-based uh, startup company, and we are working on applied spatial AI solutions. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I will uh, shop, stop uh, sharing my screen and see if anyone's got any questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Andrew, for a very interesting talk. So there are some questions already coming from the chat. I, I'll read the questions for you. So uh, one is, uh, the first question is, uh, say thank you for the nice talk. In most deep learning based semantic segmentation systems, only typically gets map values for the semantic classes. And in some sense, we lose the ability to handle uncertainty at this semantic level. Are there are easy ways to integrate the source of uncertainties too? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, a nice question. It is definitely a, a, a tricky thing. So, so if I, that we've looked at various aspects here. So in the original semantic fusion system, so actually we do use uncertainty to some extent there. So from each individual frame of semantic labels, we, we have a, you know, a distribution over classes. So we get these kind of final, like one hot vectors from our network indicating that what the network thinks is the probability of each class for each pixel. And we do actually fuse those in, in a Bayesian way. So each of our circles is holding a distribution over classes and then every new measurement will kind of be fused into that distribution. So, it, it, you know, it does happen to some extent that, that the more, um, you know, the, the more confident measurements that you fuse, the more and more confident the, 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 the probability of that, uh, of, of that uh, surface label becomes. Um, on, on the other hand, I, I think the big thing that's not taken account of in semantic fusion is, you know, every circle every little point in the scene has an independent distribution over those probabilities and that's clearly not the right thing to do so in some of the more recent work like like code slam uh scene code and and, and so on so especially scene code here where we are uh you know it's it's this small code that generates a semantic label map for the whole image but you know the way we estimate the right scene code is done in, in a in a Bayesian way. So there there we do get the ability to kind of combine information from multiple sources into the estimation of this one uh, code. And the code you know it controls whole areas of the scene in, in a more sort of 
con continuous way. So then, uh, you, you know, when you got some extra information, as you saw in the video, for instance, a whole area of the scene might suddenly flip to a different category where, where the probability gets higher. But, but these are definitely still ongoing uh, difficult things that we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on. And in general, the interaction between kind of proper Bayesian probability and neural networks and how to do that properly, I think, is, is still a very tricky thing. Okay, I uh, have another question from, from Raul Rojas. So he says, when you match a scan of 3D data points to a library of CAD objects, how do you select the subset of points that you match to a chair or a table? Mm -hmm. Are you running the align algorithm against the full set of objects in the library? Um, yeah, and, and another good question. So at the moment in the demos I showed you, yes. And, and that's because the library of objects is, is fairly small. So, so certainly in SLAM++, we were only using, I think, Probably in the demo, I, I showed those actually only four classes of objects that were actually active in that demo. And there was some kind of exhaustive search through those classes. So clearly, that's not very scalable. Um, but I think I think the path to making those things more scalable is quite well understood in, you know, in, in object retrieval, in image, image retrieval. So there are many, many you know, well-known ways to do you know, Im image and object retrieval over much larger databases using some of the methods that go back to like text uh, retrieval, bag of words, uh, that th those kind of uh, me methods where, where you build a kind of inverted index and, and, th and this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so in the demos you, you saw, we were doing something pr pretty simple, but, but I think there are quite well understood ways to try and scale to much larger uh, libraries of objects. Okay, uh, there's another question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Have you investigated what kind of structures are formed inside the implicit maps? Hmm. Uh, well, something we're very much doing at, at the moment. Um, and uh, that's it, it's, it's interesting because it's not immediately obvious how to, how to do that. So yeah, exactly. What we'd like to find out is, you know, which of the weights in the network are are generating which parts of the scene. So that seems like a very interesting question because it tells you how the network is com is compressing the scene. I, I think some aspects of that are quite obvious just from kind of looking at the at the system. So so one of the things I often point out is, so in the in the in the IMAP video, there there is uh, there's like a football on the on the floor and it, it, like an orange ball and you can see it kind of oscillates a bit um and interestingly so so you know our, our whole map kind of oscillates a little bit and that's just because there's stochastic training going on all the time in the neural network but the that the fact that the whole shape of the ball kind of oscillates in a very coherent way so in fact the whole ball gets a bit bigger and a bit smaller really shows me that there aren't many weights in the network that are generating the shape of that ball. So if, if there were a, you know, a thousand weights in the network that were generating the shape of that ball, it would be very unlikely that they would all change at the same time such that the whole ball would get bigger. But if it's only one or two or three weights, that's not that unlikely that they would all change at the same time. So, so that sort of type of analysis of, you know, perturbation uh, and, you know, if, or, or to, or to be honest, that, that's leading us towards something we're very interested at the moment, towards kind of tagging and labeling these these scenes. So if you if you you know you you see how one part of if, when you change one part of the scene, which other parts of the scene also change, that kind of tells you which parts of the scene are generated by similar paths uh, through the neural network, and and that's very. Uh, uh, Interesting, but but again, an another question where I think we still have a lot of a lot of op open questions. So so another kind of recent thing we're thinking about would be, you know, in in IMAP we are optimizing that network from zero every time we're in a new room. Sometimes that's a really interesting thing to do, but it seems like it would be useful to carry over some prior information. Uh, 
but wh where would be the right place in the network to sort of maybe lock to represent this as prior information? That that's something I don't think we have good uh, good answers to yet. Mm. Well, I, I have a question. So I'm quite interested in this idea of belief propagation. Mm -hmm. In my background in graphical models, so my question is: How do you integrate this idea with the deep neural networks, these implicit representations? Mm. How can you combine? Ah, uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, funnily enough, I was I was talking to Edgar about this <laughs> about an hour ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've got some, I've got some ideas. Uh, actually, my, my main ideas are about um, you keep keeping you know the, the factor graph and, and Ga Gaussian belief uh, propagation as as the kind of the master structure, but within that, putting in kind of modules that behave in a more general learning sense so rather than designing the whole factor graph having some kind of learnable blocks within there that operate a little bit like neural networks but are actually updated using the rules of of belief propagation that that's that's my idea at the moment that, that we're starting to try and try and work on um because i think that would have so many ad ad advantages if you can really make your learning system and then your more general sort of you know, representation and geometric system, if they work within a unified form and then, and they're using probabilistic principles, then, then I think certain things might work much better and, and might give us actually uh, finally answers to how to properly deal with the uncertainty that, that's, that we get out of neural networks. But, but yeah, yeah we're, we're going to need, need a bit longer to figure that one out, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, probably I think that the last question uh, what kind of interesting applications do you foresee in the future using the special AI systems? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I feel like there's almost no no limit. So so I feel like th this you know there's this future vision of of you know spatial computing, if you like, as the sort of next great computing platform. So imagine you really did have tiny efficient devices you know with cameras and other sensors that actually understood the space around them and maybe they can also communicate with other devices and build a sort of global understanding um i think that there's there's no end to the things that you could could do do with that um of course there's you know probably many challenges and concerns as well because it seems like very powerful technology i think um but uh yeah so some of those devices might might be robots they might be you know sensor ar arrays that, that could be monitoring uh things they they could be you, you know cleaning they they could be um yeah i don't know going, going around and cleaning up waste or or, or something in, in in the world and so solving problems that are very hard to, to solve at the moment um uh, you know, I, I think that the kind of augmented reality application in particular, when people really get that to work, I think that's going to be uh, re revolutionary because um, you know, at the moment, everyone's got used to carrying a computer with them all the time, but it's in your pocket, your, your smartphone, and you have to keep kind of bringing it out to, to, to look at it. If, if that computer, you know, was really sitting in, in here and it was able to display information to you, on top of the real world, uh, that that would it would give give you a sort of superhuman capability. You would never you would never forget anything. <laughs> uh, I, I, again, many challenges and and d difficulties that that would present. But I, I do I do think uh, you, you know that there's there's no limit to, to the sort of thing that you could do with this technology in in the longer term. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much. And I think we'll now uh, terminate our colloquial today. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank, thanks very much.